My name is Fabrizio. Is it start recording now? I, I think <laughs> it, all, it it always kicks in just slightly before, so I think you you were pretty good. Yeah, so <laughs> starting again, my name is Fabrizio. I've been working on Po, I think for two years and couple months now. And I've been working on many plugins as Pope Ansible, RPM, and I'm now majorly on the installer team. And I intend to give some overview and share my learning of the, the past months about the operator. And I would say this is kind of bold presentation, but like being full honest, it's like a kind of dumb presentation because I'm just learning it. And I had the idea of doing a live demo. So let's see how it will go. Yeah, that, that was the disclaimer. So yeah, be patient with me because I'm learning and I will be doing a live, live demo and probably things won't go as I expect. So this is like pretty hard to talk about Pope operator because there is like buzz words everywhere. So we are talking about operators, Kubernetes, Ansible roles, containers, Pope, and so on. So like if I had like a competition about like buzzwords talking, I could put everything on a title and win that easy. So, this is the, the, the thing that scares me the most, like uh, almost two years ago when I didn't know Ansible and Operator just combines the, all the YAMLs from Ansible and all the YAMLs from Kubernetes. And this is like very confusing for people that are starting on it. So I'll try to jump to a quick demo about that. So uh, he, but first, let me show it. He, he will have like the repository of Pope operator. And he has like some kind of template on how the operator works. And it comes from the operator SDK. SDK. And we, if you go to test data, you can see they have some Ansible operator just, just very similar to the structure we have. And he's the operator SDK documentation. And you can find more about the Ansible operator here. And as I said before, we mix it like Kubernetes with operate. So you ha we have some specific roles for setting pop. And you can find more about Ansible roles on oh, the Ansible documentation. This is like very good resource. But now I'll, I'll be starting the demo on OpenShift. So he, we have like the main view, the overview view, and you can start going to Operator Hub and. Yeah, when it loads. Okay. You can just find it here. And you you'll get a warning as it is a community project. It's not like a head head certified product. So okay, we just continue from that. And here you can see a bunch of information about the operator itself but we are going to, to install it. Uh, we're choosing the default namespace and waiting for the installation to complete. What is the, the installation of an operator? Is it pulling down a container that has the operator? Uh, it does have a custom resource definition. Uh, and it gets it from there and builds the operator from it. It, it, it is yet another YAML with all the specifications on, on how to build this specific operator. 
Cool. So it is building a container right now. Or, yes. is, the con or is the container pre-built uh, and it's just downloading it? I don't know the internals of OCP. And I believe a, a container is just pre-built and it's just getting all the information from Pulp. But we're the we yeah, haven't published container assets. When the operator is published, is it just that repository is published or is a container published? Oh so, yeah, this there is a pipeline on publishing the operator, and they have something. I think it's the operator lifecycle manager, and. Yeah. It, it holds our operators in a catalog. And when, when we publish that, it, it just gets saved there. Like we have, uh, I think, three versions of operator there. Mm -hmm. I, I'll show that. Um, yeah. Fabrizio, I think the important question is this. Once you install the operator, is the container uh, called pulp operator and the container called pulp? Containers called the one pop. Are they up and running? Are they running on the cluster once it's done installing? I I I, I think I understood the question. Uh, I think there is a container for all the catalog entries for all the operators out there. And right now that we got the pop installed, if you you go to pods, you can see there is a pod running and that is like an operator, pop operator pod, and and yeah. I, I I don't know exactly what was the question, but yeah, I think it tries to uh, contain this one for the catalog entries and this one that just got pulled from there that is pop operator specific. Okay, Sorry. and what Mike was asking, I think, is does installing the operator start the pop services and to me, it doesn't look like it does. It only starts the operator service. No, yeah, you need to install uh, the custom resource, the pop. So here, when you go, to... so can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, we can yes. hear you. Yeah, you're showing us. Yeah, my, my screen just uh, shut down, but so sure. keep going. So when, when uh, you go to the installer operators, you have this view here, and how the pop installation will start when you create a pop custom resource. Right, so when the operator is installed, it pulls down the operator image, the image that is basically named pop operator, but it does not pull down the image that is named pop. Yep. And so now we're going to create pulp. Because yeah. remember, an operator is basically a management container that manages the application containers. Did we just lose Fabricio? I think we did. He's frozen yeah. for me. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, that's what. So give him a sec. Yeah. So I think that's, I do want to continue the discussion about like, you know, the architecture or the design. Of the you know the the operator and the images. So remember, remember with with containers, a container is an instance, a runtime, like a running process of an image. It also has like files on disk that are attached, like temporary files, scratch files, whatever that attached to the container, and not the image. So you have a running pulp operator container from the pulp operator image when you install it. But it says I'm not going to immediately create, and I'm going to immediately download the pulp images i'm not going to really start the pulp uh, containers until you tell me how to create them it i do believe when you install the operator it, it like it understands the template for pulp but doesn't hand photo the values for how pulp should be run the template says i understand these settings a pulp yeah and that's what that uh screen was right yeah, yeah the custom, you yep. fill out those settings yes the custom resource definition says these are the settings and these are the several values and the custom resource is like i want an actual instance of pulp here's my settings so when fabricia was listing the pods i noticed that the name of the pod was something like pulp operator controller something 
So is it for this reason with, that it's called controller that it basically controls the cluster pulp deployment on the OCP? I think so. They recently yeah. they divided the pulp operator container into two different containers. And I think one's called controller, one's called something else. Oh. Uh, it's just different parts of the overall management process, you know. You could basically treat them as one uh, overall entity because they're two containers in like the same pod and they access each other's private data and stuff like that, you know. But it did, okay. ultimately, one does control the pulp application, though. Or both do to some degree or another. I, I forgot to read about the architecture. I can also provide a little bit more background. So you're running YRE doing things in Ansible. Uh, well, the, you know, the operator framework, which is, you know, the, the framework that you write against to create these management containers called operators. Uh, initially, they only supported Go because Kubernetes is written in Go and the best bindings, the best APIs are, are written in Go. And then they added support for Ansible and now Ansible is mature. And only recently they had support for Python. And I don't think you know, Python's mature not yet. Um, it's also just the highest level language you can write it in, you know, is Ansible. Okay. Speak, speak can you all hear? Yep, welcome back. Yeah, I don't know what happened. I think uh, Head Head Brazil has like accepted my resignation too early because I cannot log on any of my Head Head account now. So, Fabrizio, right. uh, what I'm hearing is you're going to like fly to Portugal. <laughs> And then log I, back in for this call, right? Yeah. So everything was ejected, and I, I just could good get back to it with my personal account. Mm. So does it still recording? We're still yeah. recording. Mike has been doing a, a, an outstanding job at covering for you <laughs> while you were having technical difficulties. <laughs> yeah, I was explaining the, uh, the like some of the high level details how a operator works and how there's operators can be written in different languages. Uh, may I ask the question at this point? Um, if you have a single pulp operator container running, is it possible to control multiple pulp installations in the same cluster by that? Multiple completely independent Sorry, installations? Can you, repeat, I mean. can you repeat that question? Um, let's say you have your cluster and you have one single pulp operator um, container, pod, whatever, running. Is it possible that this can run multiple independent installation of pulp in your cluster? Or is it like one operator per installation? The assumption I've been operating under is one operator per installation. OK, thank you. So we, we go ahead, Dennis. Oh, no, I was going to say we can't hear you, but you weren't speaking yet. <laughs> so, yeah, this is going like way beyond than I expect for the demo goals. Mode. But yeah, getting back to it. So I did install the pulp resource. Let me let me try to show the steps that I did before. So. I got here on the installed operator tabs and I installed the pop custom resource and here's where we really start to create our pop containers. So you will get to this view with some predefined files. So I put route and chose our URL here. I chose the S3 storage type because we need to set like a read write many resource. And for the filing system, it's more complicated to set it. So I 
being used in S3 for this demonstration as it is easier to set. And I set a secret and for S3 credentials and I picked that here and just hit create. So let me show here how I create the secret. So uh, you can see the secret that I created here. So it has all these values, S3, access key ID, and all these others. And I created here by going to with create a button from YAML. And I got an example from our repository when we have here on CI assets, Kubernetes and AWX. So I copied here and modified some values and put it there, hit create and done. So once I got the Pulp custom resource installed, it took care of everything like creating the Postgres container, the Redis container, the API content and so on. And you can go to all these containers, see some metrics, like in memory users, CPU users. Uh, you can see the YAML from them. You can see the logs. And when you have like two containers for one pod, you can choose here. So the pop operator keeps running a playbook for on the reconcile loop to certify that everything is as expected. So if if it notes some different, it will like act to change it. Like you can start like with two pop workers, for example, and set replicas to three. So when the, this playbook runs, it will see that it currently has two workers but it wants three, so it will act to, to get to the desired state. And here you can also go to terminal and go inside the container and do some... What is this yeah. name, Pulp Manager? Where does that come from? It comes from the template from the operator SDK. The manager is based on the Kubi builder and it is the the the, the operator node itself, as we say. Yeah, so okay. It, so this it, is it, yeah, yeah. This is the the operator, the controller pod that's running. Yes, yes. So yeah, I don't know why it froze and I cannot type here, but trust me, you can <laughs> you can like see things like at C slash pop slash chat scenes here and, and interact with your container when everything goes well. So uh, okay, let me show other things. So as it's installed, let me see networking routes. So uh, the operator create this road first and I can open this link. And let me put slash. Oops. Okay. Slash open slash API status. And see that everything is started. And you can see all the volume clans and all, all these Kubernetes objects like PVC, road, and other pods and deployments were created by the operator. So, what, what I intended to show is like uh, this, like very easy experience like just going around clicking buttons and you can have uh your pop set 
uh, just like that. So the uh, as I mentioned before, so the managers is created on top of Cube Builder, and you can see some structure like very similar to what we have on a project when on config you, you have these kind of folders let me show it on the operator itself so here on config we have uh, all the specific kubernetes uh, configuration so you can see the crg that what defines that pop object and we have some open API schema to define all the variables that you, you use as image, image version, regis image, and so on. And when that, that first moment when you, you will ask it about the when it was being pulled, the, 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 the information to build pulp, it, it comes from here. And we have a manager when we have all these configs for the operator node itself. And here at the samples, we have some examples on some variables that we set for starting pop. So you can see here, for example, if you want to start like a Galaxy installation, we have to set some specific image and set all these variables here and let me show the documentation so besides the let me get to getting started so besides the open shift we have other options to install and we have a, a basic install that you can run on, on on your Kubernetes, you just need to run, make deploy on the operator and it will populate all the Kubernetes resources it, it needs. And, and then you can set your specific custom resource for, for your needs. And the other very easy way to install it is from Operator Hub. So you go to the operatorhub.io from and looking for pulp and you can go there click install and just following all these very simple steps and you, you'll get it on your cluster and i think the last thing that i want to talk is about the container so we have uh, three types of containers. One is uh, the pulp itself, when you install like API content and work. So it's very specific to pulp. When, and the tags that we use is latest for the nightly, for the nightly builds on GitHub and is stable for the last release core and plugins versions and we use also the, the tag that is the same as the pop core like 316.0 and it gets all the comp compatible plugins with that and we have the, the web image that is an nginx image that wrote the content in the api to the pop and the other kind of image is the operator itself that, that comes with all the roles, like the roles for setting the API, content, work, workers, and so on. So, yeah, I, I, I think that that's it that I, I i had to present today and uh, sorry for all the issues with my internet and things like that
Thank you for this uh, demo. Do you want me to give a like a a here's the cool value that you know to users blurb? Yes, please. So, so yeah. So one of the you know the, the inherent things of Kubernetes, one of the features of Kubernetes that this offers, even if you weren't doing a you know a, a uh, an operator, is there are things like. Or, well, first of all, it's like it, 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 Kubernetes knows how to achieve the desired state, and, in, and it basically achieves it. If you were to, if say, if your application is randomly crashed every once in one hundred days, it would know to uh, start start more instances to bring the number of instances of the desired state. It know it would know that if the workers keep on crashing, it would just restart the workers. And then you can do other things too. You could say like Kubernetes monitor these in, these workers to make sure they're actually doing their job and if they're not responding to requests on this time, uh, we sort them. And then you can do other things for that uh, specific desired state. Like I think the desired state is inflexible on certain criteria, certain criteria I say. Like it, you can say, judge the amount of inbound traffic and the response times. And if it's, if it's too much traffic, if the response times are too long, create more instances of the workers and more instances of the, of the content apps. It it can understand it, if you write the the correct criteria for checking whether you need more instances or fewer instances, it will scale them up and down, uh, as opposed to like the fixed number of like instances, like two or three, like we had in the demo. And then the real the other the other really cool benefit, well, sorry, the, the next the reason why you need an operator as a higher layer above Kubernetes is that the, the operator understands other differences in state that need to be accomplished for all different scenarios like the operator can under will know that i need to put this application in backup mode 20 every once every 24 hours and i'm going to do all these steps to gracefully put the data everything in read only start the backup verify the backup and then restore the the cluster to read write that's that's the, the this overall the whole overall, overall the whole experience is supposed to be the user provides the settings, including for things like really odd, you know those oddball use cases like backups and then the entire you just sit back and watch. It replaces a human operator like a computer operator like a system administrator who would normally do these things by hand or with automation or with shell scripts and stuff. Fabricio, do you know if Operator Hub provides any sort of statistics about how many uh, times an operator has been downloaded? No, I don't know about that. Neither yeah, about I don't see it on the page, and I wasn't sure if like the author has some kind of other view. So I do want to point out that many of those features we talk about, like the, the auto scaling, have not been implemented yet. But Kubernetes provides an awesome framework for implementing them. Another common use case of, of operators is the upgrades, because that's, you know, it's you know, you know, a well-written installer, well-written operator, it will understand I need to go from version X to version Y. These are all the steps I have to take, all the checks I have to do along the way. Kubernetes already understands me in these checks anyway, because it uses those checks for things like uh, like uh, scaling and, and, and knowing and restarting services and et cetera. So that's there's a, there's like there's in one of the slides that Felicia showed you saw like the off I think so I think you showed it there's an op or I was definitely Googling it. Uh, there's the operator maturity model. And you would see features like that listed, like the. Oh, I, I I see some questions here. Let me share my screen again. Oh, another uh, th another cool benefit is like if users want to provide an external Postgres, they can provide external Postgres. But if not, we'll manage the Postgres, uh, as a within the. The, 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 the pop operator will manage the Postgres container for you.
So, yeah, I, I just wanted to show you how that, yeah, the terminal works. So <laughs> you, you can debug it from here. But I see some questions here up, uh, on the chat. So Melanie asked about the web UI. I think, yes, this, so let me read the question. So because this uh, has a web UI wizard for installation, would this be easy start point for a new poser when compared to Ansible installer? I think this is like, easier to get done so you can have like an installation very quickly like that and very easy but there is there are a lot of concepts to understand so in fact you will still need to understand Ansible when something like bad happens like oh my operator is not working how what happened here so when you see how this logs from the playbook and things like that you, you need to grab some names some ansible so uh, it's very easy to get it running but it is complex to maintain it on once it's there and you have some issues could um, we like th thank you fabrizio for that um yeah. i'm wondering <laughs> just from general community feedback about how difficult it is to get started, especially with the Ansible installer. And we have tried a lot during the year to improve the documentation and, you know, yourself and Mike have been instrumental in helping progress that. But I was wondering, the people that are just say looking to install Pulp, they're coming from, from backgrounds that you're probably more familiar with than I am. So the technology behind it, to some extent, there might be pros and cons of taking one approach versus the other, depending on their own expertise. And I was wondering, would it be useful maybe to put together like a, a battle card of some kind with advantages of this and disadvantages versus the the requirements between these two? Like this, to me, this looks a lot more seamless than what I've seen of the the other installation method and I suppose from a community perspective I'm I'm quite you know I will be quite excited to find an easier path through for for people so is there a chance that we could put together some card like that or some kind of overview in a very simplistic way that that people could maybe grasp their their options so you want to have some kind of comparison of the different installation methods um, for between the Ansible installer, this operator, and the single container. Yeah. So the so the the single container is the single container, and I suppose in my opinion, it would be ideal to have a production ready single container, and then yes, I, we could just stop this conversation. You know, um, in terms of new from a new user perspective. But in, I, I suppose what I'm trying to say, Dennis, is I'm coming to this with the assumption that someone who wants to use Pulp is coming from a background that is not just say, um, how would you say, like queen cake baking or something. They they actually know other things. And I would like a, I suppose, a, a requirements chart as in like a like a prerequisite in terms of um, what what you would need to know to to get going with this you know what what technologies this involves and the kind of concepts that are essential and maybe in a we could provide we could provide a like a versus ansible installer for for this option so if one might be easier than the other for a particular individual and if we have this available i think that we should get as many eyes on it as possible Yeah, I agree a lot with that. Like, you know, my my planned upcoming presentation on the on the installer will cover here's what it's like to actually use the installer as a user. Here's the dependencies, like you have to install a suitable version of Ansible, and here's how you would install it. And here's what it's like to deploy and like, oh, you, you made a boo-boo in your variables. It's not the end of the world, but you have to modify the variables and then rerun the installer and it's safe to rerun it. But 
users just see a cryptic error and you know and that's supposed to be a launching point for solutions like uh do we want to improve the error messages uh over override the default error messages do we want to uh engine change the user experience they're not going to run those errors commonly you know um yep and I'm but the, the dependencies is a big part of it and the knowledge required is a big part of it too because like an ansible user will be much more comfortable rerunning the installer than somebody who's not have ansible knowledge yeah and i think similarly here uh person who's familiar with open with Kubernetes is going to be much more comfortable with this, you know, than yeah. somebody who has to learn like Kubernetes and Paul. Um, yeah. So I'm looking at our docs. And I'm sorry, did I interrupt you, Brian? Well, I was, uh, I was gonna share one thing, which is, um, I used to use this project called free NAS. This is like decades ago. Um, and before I did a lot of work, like with my own Linux administration, and it would out of the box create for you a man like a raid big uh network file system and you just put in the hardware and you just run this little installer and poof it just works and that was great right up until it broke and then it was so easy to get going but i had no knowledge or development along the way that when something didn't work perfectly i was screwed um now i didn't keep anything important on there but anyways this is something that happened to me um i just wanted to share i think it's somewhat related like what do you do when things go wrong that's just such an important question yeah hey there's a question in the uh, matrix chat asking to see if we can demonstrate how to add a, another worker pod in the with the operator is that possible right now to scale it yeah but mm -hmm. let me just like continue on, on this topic so i think like as this is like very easy to go through UI, I think it is good for people that want to try pop and see if it matches their needs. Like, oh, I wanted to build some PyPI. Let, let me just run like some clicks here and there and see how, how pop up is. So you get like get rid of the complexity of installation and you can see, oh, this is how Python works. And you, you, you can see like, oh, now I, I know how, how it is and I can decide if I will move forward to that or not. But yeah. But you also have we... to have access to Kubernetes. Yes. Like, there is, you know, <laughs> this is what I think Melanie is kind of getting at is that there is like each option has its own set of requirements. And what I'm not seeing listed in our docs, when you go to docs.pellproject.org under installation options, any information about all of this. And I think um, we the docs there focus solely on the Ansible installer. And I feel like the landing page should probably give you those options. So uh, Dennis, you said that uh, we want to see about... a demo of scaling of the pub workers. Yeah, so currently we do it like manually. So I go here on installed operators, go on pull custom resource, and I, I click on the installed one and I can change the YAML there. So, uh, so work current has two replicas. I can put, I don't know, four. And save. And the reconcile will trigger and it starts to run. And, and soon we'll have like two more pods here. It takes a while because it runs the entire playbook and all the roles until it finds what is different from what it expects. So, yep, it will probably be here in a couple minutes. But I'm, I see all the question here on the chat about yeah from Ina. Is there some de definition of backup and restore? Yes, we do have it's almost the same thing for, from the pulp resource. You can go here and 
on, on the backup and create one. We have already some predefined values here. And here you just declare the name of the custom resource you have that you want to backup. And when you, we create it, you create uh, some container and a new volume to back up all this data and use the backup role for saving uh, for everything. And the history is pretty similar and you point to a backup instance and it will restore all the data back to the cluster. And let me go back to pods and see if there is, yeah, now you can see more workers there, one, two, three, four. When you create a backup, do you get somehow to define what you want to backup? I don't know, some directories, database, or this sort of details where they are defined? Uh, no, uh, we, we, the backup, current, it just gets all the Kubernetes objects and the data that you have, like the, the SQL data and the artifact data and, and things like that and store it in a new volume. Thank you. Yeah, and to clarify, volume is basically like a file system, usually on top of a hard disk image, but it, it Kubernetes abstracts what's the underlying thing for you. And it's a persistent volume, which means it's the file system exists indefinitely. It's not like scratch or ephemeral. And I want to point out also, we've you know we've we've had in this into our two main installation methods of the operator and the install installer. We've had two easy to use deploy. Uh, really quick to do uh, deployment methods over the over the last few years. One is the single container, which puts all the services in one container and, you know, the user has to like mount uh, their, their, their file systems that they protect, you know, or they back up into the container image. And the other one is, uh, I call it InstaDemo. It deploys a lightweight version of Kubernetes called K3S. Yes, it's a K3S, it's K3S. And and then it deploys the pulp operator on top of it. So it's basically you run one shell script on any standard Linux distribution and any remotely standard Linux distribution. And there's pulp running as an application. Yes, there's a big Kubernetes lamb underneath it, but it's still pulp running as an application. And when you want to un uninstall it, you can just uninstall K3S. Um, actually provides an uninstaller, which is nice. <laughs> um, we, we decided to stop maintaining that because it's kind of, uh, we didn't want to support that use case uh, once we had a single container, but it's still promising. It just didn't, it did not have a web UI, but for all I know, there could be something like K3S right now uh, with a web UI. It did not require virtual machines or anything. It had bundled its own container runtime. Um, so that was, it's really not, it's not maintained right now, but it exists in Git and it's really nice actually. So easy to install, but you don't have the web UI to help you configure stuff, though. Yeah, that's one of the things about using OCP. I'm just musing out loud here. There are, there's the experienced software repository management person that wants to experiment with Pulp. There are people that understand Kubernetes and have been asked to experiment with Pulp. There are folk that are kind of clueless at both those levels. I, you know, I, I got told I had to manage repositories and I don't understand Kubernetes, but OCP has this really nifty web UI and I can just push buttons until things work. Um, and all of those are useful, actually, um, useful use cases. Although the less you know about all the pieces, the more you get bitten by what we've talked about, which is as long as the main path goes fine, you're great. And then as soon as something goes wrong, the less you know about the pieces, the more helpless you end up being. Because at, at the end of the day, 
repository management is complicated, pulp is complicated, Kubernetes is complicated, OCP has a whole bunch of switches you have to push in exactly the right order if anything goes wrong. Um, it would be kind of, it would be interesting to see if we could come up with a page for each of these of these options that are, I know nothing. Okay, here's a cargo cult list of commands you can run. And at the end of that, pulp is up and running. What do I do if things go wrong? Okay, for that, you have to learn more. But here it is, you know, for each of these, if you do this, you will get pulp running in a given environment. Now, so if I'm, for example, if I know a lot about OpenShift and Kubernetes, and um, I go to a page that says, here's a cargo cult thing for how to get it up in OCP. I can say, oh, I understand all of that. And there's this one thing that's new to me and it'll come up and run and I can concentrate on that one new thing. That might be a, a place to go over the course of the next six months to, to open up the, the list of people is pick the thing that you know about, here's the instructions for how to, how to get it, get pulp up and running in that environment without explaining anything extra. Just acknowledging this is cargo cult scripting, run this script and pulp will come up. And if you run this script, then you'll see that it's up and here's how you can interact with it. Um, might be useful for us to get over that, that initial hump to the degree that that made any sense to anybody outside of my own head. Yeah, so I th here's, here's the answer to your question about how, when we can do that and when we cannot do that. There's basically three types of variables for for the installer and two types of variables for pop operator. Uh, the three types of variables for the installer are plugin versions. This does not exist in, in, the, in the operator because we provide the plugin versions for you. You can't pick them, you can't choose them, uh, or which ones even. And then the second is like make it compatible with your environment. This is the part where there's always tricky stuff. Like sometimes it's distro specific settings or how the distro is configured and the Ansible installer has to account for those weird distro settings. Other times it's other stuff across their environment like that we have to account for the overall IT environment. And this is where Kubernetes comes in too. Like you wanna use an external Postgres. Okay, just if you specify the settings wrong, you're gonna get an error and the error is gonna be pretty much what Postgres client would say or Ansible's version of what Postgres client would say. And then the third is uh, like general preferences. And generally the general preferences aren't gonna mess you up. If you lower the number of workers per node, you're gonna have performance issues. Uh, so the, you know, really, really the, it's number two that that's the tricky part is how do you, do you provide useful error messages when things fail to deploy because you pointed it, you told it to connect to your Postgres server in the wrong way, or you did tell to talk to your Postgres server in the right way, but there's something in the middle interfering like on, on your network. It's stuff that's, that's where the real complexity lies. And you know, we'll, we'll be brainstorming ideas for how to overcome that. Uh, uh, for the installer, but we can brainstorm ideas how to overcome that here for the Kubernetes operator. Like, look at the terminal, see that when the see that when the Kubernetes operator tried to run this Ansible role to configure the post to, and the Ansible role would call the like post pulp database config, like create the tables and stuff like that. Oh, that failed to create the tables. Oh, that did talk that failed to talk to the server in the first place. It's that debugging of the of the of the environment integration. It's all complicated. <laughs> oh. Yeah, this is why I keep thinking like I've kind of been obsessed over the past couple of years about making our installers and the the onboarding experience easier, make it easier. Like almost obsessive about it. But the more and more I think about it, the more I think that maybe we need to try to create a place, like maybe it's discourse or something like that, that people can you know, go when they don't have problems. I mean, I'd love to have our things do more kind of automated, autonomic, um, helpful responses, better error message, whether it's fancy or simple, doesn't really matter. Kind of like what you're talking about in the chat here, Jared. Um, I mean, that I think is definitely a right way to go. But until we reach that amazing place, 
you know, maybe just better error messages and a place where people can go um, to create a, a I, I almost, I don't like this term, community of practice. Several jobs ago, I used to um, try to help make communities of practice. That was like what we were employed to do. I'm pretty jaded on that term. But I mean, our support model right now is like, you're an end user. Oh, it doesn't go great. Open a bug. Talk to us as developers, but maybe a peer to more of a peer to peer discussion area. And you do that by creating a place. Yeah. And oh, I just had one good idea uh, for how to get users easily to try to to get attract, get more users to successfully install pulp is try to s let's improve the, the single container and sell them on it aggressively because the single container does not do all the integrations with the environment. It does not use an external Postgres. And then have instructions. Here's how you upgrade from the single container to the operator. Here's how you upgrade from the single container to the installer. Or, or migrate from it. Yeah, yeah. And the thing is, the single container can be hooked up to an external database. It okay. can be hooked up to an external Redis. Like, it can, t it can be hooked up to S3 storage. Um, so it's really flexible actually. Yeah. And, um, all, if, you know, if you have your container to hook up to all those things externally, it doesn't matter. Like it's real easy to migrate to something else. Yeah. We still need the migration instructions though. So they know how they can go from the yeah. local Postgres to the real Postgres cluster. So we have a the, we have a scheduled um, community discussion on the installation options, don't we? On Wednesday, I think, or do we? Uh, so uh, yeah. we might. I might need more time to prepare that simple answer, uh, but looks like. Uh, but yeah, currently for Wednesday, I think yeah. Great, great. So perhaps just I'm aware of the yeah. hi, the time, um, but we obviously have a lot to unpack and discuss around these topics. So I think there is some time later to do that for sure. Um, Fabrizio, thank you very much for this. I'm going to stop the recording and then in seven minutes we'll be back with um, Mr. Douglas oh. Furlong. I believe. Uh, let me just finish it real quick. Sure, sure, so, sure. Yeah, I had like a thank you slide at the end, but uh, I'm locked out of all my Red Hat account. So the only thing that I, I wanted to highlight is like what we currently talk on IRC matrix is poke, but it's like very inside. And we are talking with like the survivors, people that went through the installation and, and could make it. So we are losing like so many people out there. And I did this presentation to show that installation can be easier. We and we I wanted to start out this discussion around how can we make it easier and get more users. So uh, I, I think I, I, I could accomplish it. I know that the installation is easier, but we still have lots and lots of complex topics. But yeah, I hope in the future you will get everything easier. So thank you everyone. And sorry for all the issues that I had on my presentation. It's no not your fault. Demo God must have blood, so. Yeah. Yeah, thank you.